TDD is an important improvement in software quality, but it's sometimes a subtle skill to learn. How can we get better design through TDD? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. I believe that test driven development is the best way to improve the design of our software. If that sounds the backwards to you, using test driven development to improve the design rather than designing and then testing it, please watch to the end of the video and see if I can convince you. In order to be able to test anything, we need to think about what testing really means and we need to start taking it seriously. We need to be able to control the variables uh, in the system that we are trying to test. We need to think about separating concerns so we can focus our efforts in on the system that we're trying to test so that we can take control of it. And we need to work in small pieces and not whole systems in order to be able to eliminate some of the complexity in the signals that we gather from our tests. I've produced a guide to test driven development which you can download for free. The details of how to get hold of it are available in the description below. In this episode I'm going to give some examples of both good and bad test code. Uh, we're going to ex I'm going to explain why we should use fakes to make our testing more effective and describe a classic test anti-pattern and pro uh, provide a solution uh, to that pattern. We're going to explore some ideas that at first look might feel like detail. It might feel like, you know, this is kind of down in the weeds, but actually I think that it touches on some much more important uh, points about test driven development and about automated testing and testing in general. Um, one thing to be wary of, uh, we're not going to be exploring testing in the context of legacy systems here. I recognise that that's a completely different problem, so if you'll bear with me, we're going to focus on what good would be, uh, and we will talk another day about how you could apply that kind of thinking in, in legacy systems. So we're going to start from the, a clean sheet of paper and, and, and simpler systems to think about. I think a useful place to start is to think about the two different kinds of testing that are kind of common and we can kind of apply this to thinking about real world things. If you imagine uh, testing a car, uh, there are going to be two very distinct, at least two very distinct kinds of testing. At the one end of the spectrum, you're going to have uh, some engineers that are testing components of the car, maybe testing the tensile strength of a bolt or the, the flow rate of a carburetor and all of those sorts of things. At the other end of the spectrum, you're going to have somebody like Jeremy Clarkson whizzing down a road and complaining that the wing mirrors don't line up properly. These are two very different approaches to testing and you wouldn't expect to evaluate the technical details of the creation of the car uh, while driving down a road and deciding whether you look nice in it or not. These are different things. When we start thinking about applying this to, uh, uh, to software development, we still need these two different kinds of testing. Uh, I would argue that focusing on the desired behaviour of our systems is deeply important for both of these kinds of testing. We want to create useful, executable specifications for the behaviour of our system, whether we're talking at the Clarkson level or whether we're talking at the engineering level. If you want to test something, anything, uh, we need to control the variables. We want our tests to be deterministic. We want them to be reliable and repeatable. We'd like to be able to run the same test over and over again and get the same results each time. Uh, to do this, we really do need to take control seriously. One of my favourite descriptions of test driven devel development comes from a friend of mine, Josh Graham, and he said that we need to create a tiny universe where the software exists uh, to do one thing and do it well. And that's the focus of our test. So our job is to control the universe in which our test operates so that it can be repeatable and reliable. We have less control the more complex the system is. So the, the more complex the system, the more difficult this, is, this repeatability and reliability is to achieve. 
Here's an illustration of why controlling variables and working with small steps and good separation of concerns is essential uh, for technical testing. Let's imagine that we were going to uh, build a device for measuring the flow through a pipe. Uh, so here's our device, we're going to create this device. Now how are we going to test this? The classic way if this was a piece of software is like this. We'd introduce all of the pieces where the software was, uh, was involved and we'd just kind of run uh, fluid through the system and see how it worked. Now there are serious problems with this approach. If all of the components of the whole system are joined together in this way, it means that there are lots of things that we can't do. It also means that an error in the testing of our system might be caused by something downstream or something upstream. If we were measuring the rate of flow in this pipe, maybe the tap is not generating enough pressure to push the water in th that, that, that we desire. And maybe there's back pressure in the system downstream that's preventing that flow from achieving the results that we want, and that's changing the value. We're not really measuring the effectiveness of the component that we're interested in in this situation. We're looking at the whole system. We can learn useful things from that. We know whether there's a, a leak at the join in one place or another, all of those sorts of things, but they're different lessons. And we should focus on those, those lessons being different and concentrating our tests uh, on the, the, the information that we are trying to gather. In this, in this diagram, we can kind of, you can kind of imagine a more effective approach would be to eliminate the, the, those extra pieces of complexity. If we could take those away and instead concentrate on the system that we wanted to test, if we could simulate the inputs at one end and uh, have a point of measurement close to the, the system that we are trying to evaluate, that's going to give us much greater control. Now we can simulate exactly, precisely the flow that we want to be able to measure and see whether we get the result that we want. How would this system behave if the flow went above the limits that we wanted it to? Or what if the, 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 the flow was incredibly low? We can measure all of these things if we've got control. What if the flow was backwards? What would happen to our system? Would it break the system? All of these things are in our control as soon as we eliminate the rest of the complexity of the system. So unit testing is really important and that te technically fo focused evaluation of the components of our system gives us deep insights that are simply not available with more systemic, system-wide uh, approaches to testing. Uh, Low-level test-driven development gives us full control of the universe in which our code executes, or it should. So now I'm going to give you some examples of good and bad test code. I'm just going to set this thing running, uh, and I'll explain why later. So here's some code. Uh, this, is, this is code from, uh, from an open source uh, code base and it's using uh, HTML uh, unit uh, as, a, as a background uh, underneath the covers to, te to apply this kind of test case. You can read through this code uh, and see what's going on. The first thing this does is it creates something um, called a Jenkins rule class, which is 2,323 lines of code. Um, that's probably not a great start in a unit test. Uh, but it's, it, there's, a, there's a lot of code there. And then we can kind of start reading through the details and to try and figure out what this is doing. It's going to create a web page, so it's going to be deploying a bunch of the system into a web page, and then it's going to start that up, and it's going to interact through that web page. It's going to put some values into uh, input boxes, and it's going to determine the value. And then what it's really testing, the focus of this test is... If the URL that I specify has localhost in the name, it should give me an error message. Well, that's clearly a useful piece of behavior. But I think that if you'd written this test before you wrote the code, you'd be worrying about the amount of work that you had to go to in order to get to the point of determining whether the URL with localhost in it was right or wrong. That seems like a different kind of error. Sure, there are times when you want to start up the whole system and get the web server deployed and test it through there. Certainly there are. Uh, 
But in this case, if we're just looking at an error at that level of resolution, this feels a bit like having Jeremy Clarkson driving the road, down the road doing um, s uh, s slides around a corner at 100 miles an hour while trying to me measure the, 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 the airflow through the carburetor. Doesn't sound like the right kind of test to me. My version looks more like this. So here's some code. This is my test and the naming I think is a bit better. Should throw an exception uh, if URL contains localhost. And we're going to create a new class that I've invented called Jenkins URL. I'm going to set the, the value attribute of the URL to localhost and I'm expecting to see an expect, uh, exception. That's it. Here's the code that this is testing. This is if the URL contains localhost, throw the exception. That's everything. All of the code that I've just shown you, the test and the system, that's all of the code you need. The thing that I started running at the beginning was a, a, a dump of the Jenkins rule, 2,323 lines of code. Um, and so, just there, that be, should be setting off alarm bells in terms of the complexity of this piece of code for the value that it's delivering. Also the efficiency. My test is going to run literally in milliseconds. This is probably going to take a few seconds. So my test is probably on the scale of using thousands of times fewer resources in terms of the test effectiveness than, than, than this test. As I've said, there's a place for those, those larger whole system tests, but the first one is using Clarkson level testing to check a technical thing, and that's always a bad idea. This is an example of a common anti-pattern uh, in testing that, that I see quite often. It's a, it's a pattern called excessive setup. Uh, and I'll come to solutions and the use of fakes that I promised you in a minute, but let's start by looking at why this is a bad idea. If tests are complex to set up, it's telling you something. It's giving you a signal. And what you should be interpreting from that signal is that there's something wrong with your design. If the test is difficult to set up, if it requires an excessive amount of work to get the system into a state to be able to tell, test it, it means that there's too much coupling in the system on the test. There's too, there are too many surfaced interactions that you shouldn't need to care about. And so we can use those signals to drive our design. This anti-pattern of excessive setup is often caused by poor separation of concerns in the system under test, as I said. The problems that it generates is that the, the test and the system under test become deeply coupled because uh, because the, there's so much surface area that must be correct in order for the test to execute. And so the test becomes fragile. The system is more inflexible. If it takes all of this work to get the system into a state that I want it to be test, I'm unlikely to be able to use it in a variety of different circumstances. It also means that the whole thing, probably the system under test, but certainly the test code, is going to be much more difficult to understand and much less useful as a tool to debug and dig into the problems that, are, that arise. The correction for this problem is to improve the separation of concerns in the system under test. That's a design thing. That's not about the test. That's not about the quality of the test, but the, the design, developing the test first and noticing that there was this problem has given us a signal that we can listen for and act on to improve the quality of our design. We can also improve the abstraction in our system under test. We can start to think about drawing lines within our system that clearly delineate different behaviours and different uh, uh, attributes of the system to make the system more testable. Designing for testability often aligns very, very closely with designing for high quality. The attributes that are necessary for testability are the same kinds of attributes that we expect in a high quality system. And practice test first. We, we can correct this excessive setup problem by practicing test first because you have to be slightly insane to write a massively complicated setup for a simple test case like the one that we've just seen 
if you were starting from the position of the test. If you were writing that test, immediately you'd be going, this is more work than I want to do. I'm going to do something else. I'm going to change my design to make my life easier. So use the signals from test design to make decisions about the design of your system under test. I call this listening to the tests. By abstracting conversations between uh, uh, units, it makes them easier to fake. By drawing the lines in the design of our system, that makes it clearer where the units that we're interested in tests, the boundaries of the units that we're interested in testing are. TDD uh, uh, allows us to design our test first. It means that we can design those interfaces. It means that we can use the creation of our test case to design a nice, neat interface to a collaborator with the piece of code that we're working on. And then we can use dependency injection to deliver that collaborator or rather a fake version of that collaborator into the test case. And that gives us one of these points of measurement that I was talking about earlier. It gives us an opportunity to capture the results from our test case without breaking the encapsulation of our code. This again is a good impact, has a good impact on the design of our code. Higher level tests are inefficient at testing um, detail of function or performance in code. We don't want to use those kinds of tests for those, kind, for those kinds of learnings. They, they're very good at testing whole systems. You can think of those as closer to so smoke tests. They go a bit more detailed than smoke tests, but essentially those tests should be about high level scenarios through the application to largely ensure that the application's plugged together correctly and, and configured correctly. The detail of the function of the system comes from the test-driven development, the fine-grained unit tests that clearly test the behavior. And then if you start becoming addicted to test-driven development, you can really go to town. You can test all of those crazy cases as well as the straightforward ones. In summary then, testing systems is not enough on its own. Problems in testing mean problems in design, they highlight problems in design to us, and we can drive good design from tests. My recommendation is always test with fakes at the level, uh, at the level of unit testing. Always. Thank you very much for watching. I'd like to take this moment to thank everybody for supporting my channel. It's grown uh, much more quickly than we'd expected. Thank you very much for your support. Uh, if you haven't already subscribed, please click subscribe and like and hit the notification bell if you think that appropriate. Uh, also, I'd like to encourage people to, to give us feedback. This video is based on a suggestion from, from a, a viewer of a, an earlier episode. And if you do have any ideas that you'd like me to cover, please do let me know. I'm happy to kind of take that kind of input. Thanks again for your support.